and all of our all of our recordings are on the uh, YouTube channel, the PPF YouTube channel. So feel free to go back and watch the past meetings if you haven't been to any of them this year. They're all up there. Okay, so uh, a couple of announcements before we get going. Uh, Johanna, did you want to talk about your photo item? So, uh, Johanna. Okay, I just go. got it. No, I got it. <laughs> well, we're going to have this uh, little event over here where I live. A it says on the website a, a studio event. It's actually a natural light for, uh, portrait event. We're going to have models, and everybody is invited to come and take as many pictures of the as they wish as of as many different models as they wish here. Uh, the models are all old people like me in the place that I live in. Uh, there's one guy, others are women. And um, there are three of us involved. If you've enjoyed Ray Bittigan's wonderful portraits or Pat Rose's beautiful portraits, they will be on site with me. The three of us will be on site, not to teach, but to consult. We're interested, it's really an opportunity for you to take portraits. A lot of people are shy about taking portraits, especially of strangers. So this is a chance to get over that shyness in a controlled kind of fashion. Everybody is gonna be having a good time. And uh, let me know, Call, uh, email me or call me to let me know that you're coming. Anything you wanna to add to that, Pat? Not really. I think you said it all, except if you want, if they wanted to join the, I think it's uh, your phone number was listed somewhere. Uh, was it, it, but not probably not on the website. Is there a, well, I know that my uh, email is listed um, uh, on the on that uh, announcement. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also it should be on the events page on our website. I believe it's there too. Yeah. Yeah. So Johanna, what's fun. the date? Uh, oh, I'm oh. sorry. September the 10th. It's a Sunday. It's uh, it's not a Sunday school. We changed the name to Outing. Um, Joe uh, was the lead on that. And, and the reason it's not a Sunday school is because it's not a class, really. It's more an opportunity. So there'll be oh. uh, backdrops, we should point out. Yeah. Um, probably going to be a black backdrop and a white, uh, a gray backdrop. And uh, the windows are facing west. So the light in that room, so that the amenities room at Johanna's uh, uh, building in the south waterfront. And uh, there's also a beautiful outside sort of courtyard area if somebody wants to go out and get more natural light. Uh, with possibly some foliage, foliage, foliage in the background or or whatever. So there'll be a few different opportunities for posing your models. Uh, sounds like a fun get together. Yeah, it sounds fun. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And I should mention that we're not going to use lights, like no strobe lights, or uh, we use reflectors and other things to enhance the natural light. And you don't have to bring any equipment except your camera, pot, tripod if you want to use it. And we will supply all the reflectors and uh, um, light diffusers and uh, that sort of thing. All right. Thanks, Johanna and Pat. Uh, Tim, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about the book project that you've been working on? Uh, yeah, um, I guess the, the latest newsletter uh, kind of introduced the uh, the project, uh, so there's some details in that. Um, but a little while back, Mark asked me if I would coordinate a, a PPF photo book for this year, and I, I have done a number of blur books before and familiar with the software, so I was uh, happy to take that on, and it should be pretty fun. Uh, the big challenge initially was, of course, to come up with a theme uh, for the book. Um, there's a real diverse group of photographers in PPF, so um, I wanted to try to have a theme that was somewhat focused, but yet allowed for 
a whole variety of, of styles and techniques uh, or whatever people are into um, to be represented. And uh, I've been working with um, Mark and uh, Bob Bergstrom also sort of as a as a little planning team to kind of get started on this. And uh, uh, we came up with the idea that maybe we could have uh, people sort of make up their own theme in a sense. Uh, I got this idea because watching um, meetings like this uh, and the presenters, the particularly the you know the member presenters, uh, people uh, on Instagram, uh, things that people were showing at the print shares. And I saw that so many people had some really fascinating things that they're currently working on in terms of projects or collections. And so I thought if people could then kind of re represent that work that they're doing now, it would give a good snapshot of the uh, overall kind of status of where we are as an organization and what, what the members are actually working on and what they're interested in. But you know, those projects would also be uh, cohesive and, and focused so that there would be, uh, you know, it just wouldn't be like your five best pictures or something like that. But, you know, something that you're really working on right now that kind of represents you uh, where you're at on your photographic journey at this point in time. So uh, that was kind of the idea behind it. Um, we've got some more detailed information. I guess, Mark, you were going to put out, um, mm -hmm. you know, more yeah. of the, that we originally worked on to. Yeah, I'll be sending. I'll be sending. I'll be sending out your full announcement this week. I didn't want to put all of that into the newsletter, so that I yeah. wanted separate so everybody could focus on it. So, right. that, so everybody look forward to getting that email a little later this week. They'll have all the details. Can I ask? Uh, can I ask him a question? Sure. Um, to, uh, or is there going to be a, a place for a little bit of uh, copy or text uh, with the photographs, or how 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 do you envision that? Yeah, it's it'll be actually very similar to the the style of the last book that uh, Pat Willie was heavily involved in, um, where there's well we're looking at about five photographs from each person. You don't have to submit that many, but we'd like a collection that would be representative of what you're doing, and I think five would be uh, a good number. And there will be a uh, everybody will be asked to do a little write up of a little short paragraph or two. Of what that's all about for them um and uh so yeah there'll be there'll be a little text section and then each person will probably have a two-page spread just like in the uh, uh what was it called the uh a break in the clouds book and we're at least initially looking at probably the same style and same size uh, of the book because i think it works pretty well it's not too expensive to produce it'll we may have to be a little flexible to depending on how many people want to participate. I'm hoping a lot, but uh, I guess in the past, it's been around 40 or so, but if we get a lot more, then we might have to rethink a few things, but uh, that's kind of what we're thinking at at this point in time. All right. Uh, thanks, Tim. And uh, Giannis, you'll get some of the answers also when that announcement goes out, you get a little bit more of the details. Okay. Yeah. Mark, um, I think we do not have a photo outing scheduled um, after Johanna's in September. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would be uh, be great if someone has something there, someplace they are interested in going. Um, I would mention, and I can provide more details, um, there's an annular eclipse October 14th. And it's passing right over the Crater Lake area. And uh, so I am have a trip planned. We're going to camp at Diamond Lake, and there's a Tipsu Peak, which is close by and has a, a trail up to the summit. And so our plan is to uh, go up and uh, be on the summit of Tipsu Peak by about 8 or 8.30 and be ready for the, uh, the eclipse, which is supposed to happen about 9.30. So it's about a three-mile hike, I think, or something like that. So... Uh, it's a wilderness area, so but I think I have like four or five spots still available for the 12. So if anyone's interested in, in joining uh, my group on that, that would be something. But if someone else has something else they want to do in October, that would be great, too. All right. Thanks, Joe. All right. Let's go ahead and get moving because we've got a lot going on today. Uh, Bob Bertram is going to show the photo challenge slideshow. And I think it's, uh, Bob, I think you said it's about 20 minutes this time. Yeah, this time it's about 23 minutes. We had a really good turnout 
Let me do my screen share. And uh, Bob also added music this time. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. It looked real good from what I saw. So this time we have music. <laughs> Oh, can you hear that music? No. Okay. Uh, let me do the. Uh, All right. Sound share. Got I it. I think that's one of those things you have to do per meeting. Yeah. Okay.
Nice work, everybody. Bob, thanks for putting that together. Yeah, thanks for everybody who contributed. We had a really good turnout and really interesting, fascinating photos. Next month's topic will be the dance of life. So anything with movement or rhythm. All right, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so next up we have uh, Kathy Reddy with her short 15-minute uh, program. I saw you come in earlier, Kathy. There you are. Hello. There you go. I'll give you, uh, when you get to five minutes, I'll let you know. Okay. Um, you see where the share the screen? Yep. There you okay. go. Wow. You got A little it. nervous after last time I was on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, well, hello, everybody. For those who don't know me, my name is Kathy Rady, and um, I am going to show you um, a series that I call my Northern Series, and the first grouping are some that I took in um, the late 70s, and they were in um, Barrow, Alaska, Nome, Alaska, and then the last few I have from um, the Arctic in Siberia. And then I move on to um, current images. Um, I'm back to Alaska, some fishing scenes, landscapes, and portraits of people in Alaska from this last summer and winter. So here we go. No music, sorry. <laughs> You working okay? Yeah, I was using my um, forward button and it wasn't going, but I think it is now. Okay. This is an interesting um, Brower's Cafe. Um, this was a uh, Charles. Brower arrived in Barrow, Alaska in 1886 as a whaling crew member and he established a trading post. And this is part of the cafe trading post and became, it's he was the first white settler. He married two native women and sired 14 children. Today, many of the community leaders, white and Eskimo bear his name. And uh, he died in uh, 1945 and this cafe still stands um, up north in the Arctic. I had the opportunity to go out um, with a whaling captain on um, out to their whaling camp. And um, it was pretty fascinating. When we were out there, when we went out on a snowmobile, you could hardly um, tell where the horizon was, where the ice ended and the sky started. It was, it was uh, uh, scary going out there. I couldn't figure out how they could find their way out there because there were no landmarks. So I was glad to return safely. Here they were in their um in their tent taking a break from whale hunting. And this skips right across about four, four and a half miles to the Russian Arctic. And historically, they um, they believe that uh, the Eskimos of Alaska and the natives of Siberia were related. Um, so I threw these photographs in just to show their lifestyle. I'm going to switch over to um, some fishing 
scenes in Alaska from this past summer. How long were you there this summer? Two months. Wow. Kathy, you've probably explained that like, uh, uh, what what's your attraction? What attracts you up here to the north? Um. I went up when I was, um, when I got out of school, I took a backpack and went up to Alaska, just wanted to explore. And it just, it just stole my heart. And um, I've been going back ever since. I lived there for about 10 years and then moved down to the Pacific Northwest. And um, it just has a, a pull on me. Um, I just, I love it there. So I, I like to photograph. Kathy, someone asked question? a question. Someone asked a question about what camera you're using. Um, I'm using the um, a Canon camera. It's digital. The first early ones were um, with film, black and white film. And Kathy, when you go out to photograph in these scenes, do you have like themes in mind or do you just kind of like what grabs your attention and your eye at the moment? Or how do you go out and know when to click the shutter? Um, well, I one of the things that I've enjoyed doing is going on boats and watching people work and the type of work they do in Alaska. Um, I'm, I've been really fascinated with the um, commercial fishermen and how they do all their, um, how they keep their boats, how they work so hard um, and just, I'm, I'm fascinated with their lifestyle. So that's one of the things that I enjoy doing. And then there's so much beauty around. It's just whatever at the moment makes me feel happy, I guess. Um, and, and sometimes I, I focus in on certain themes and I stick with that. I, I've done a whole series of just portraits. And um, and then I've done a lot of boating scenes. And then sometimes I'm in the mood to do abstracts. So I'm I'm all around um, whatever at the moment makes makes me feel good. Does that answer your question? Yes. It's really a rugged place. And like here in this photograph, these people are working hours and hours and hours before they go out fishing and these nets, they have to get them all lined up and, and um, ready to go. And they spend probably more time messing with, the, working with their nets than they do fishing sometimes. This woman was cleaning the boat. I looks like a big job to me. <laughs> a little kitchen sponge. Yeah.
Is all of this from this summer, Kathy? Yes. Except the earlier ones. Mm, right. This is a great place to hike. It's just um, nobody out there. I don't know where the road goes to, but Just to let you know, Kathy, you have five minutes left. Okay. These are someone the is, uh, some oh. someone is asking if you did any darker printing for these photos. Um, just the early ones. Um, these are the people of um, the community of Valdez, Alaska. A lot of the boating pictures are from Valdez, um, and these are just some of the people that live in the area. Small town, about two thousand people. And this, this is someone who was tailgating me in the car. I couldn't resist. <laughs> so that's um, the end. You sure packed a lot in the 15 minutes. <laughs> it looks like a successful trip this summer, too. It was. It was wonderful. Anybody have any quick questions for Kathy? Yeah, uh, I do. I if, just uh, wanted... Oh, mm. Go ahead, Johanna. 
I, I just want to say, Kathy, I normally portraits are my thing, uh, but those snow landscapes are just gorgeous. Oh, thank, thank you. I agree, Johanna. Uh, uh, Kathy, what, what Johanna says. Um, I loved all these pictures, but I was really struck by your black and white uh, uh, landscapes and your documentary uh, environmental photos. The landscapes were stunning, and you have such a facility for contrast and composition that you just nailed those black and white landscapes. They're just beautiful. But I wanted to ask you how you approach your documentary, uh, you know, the environmental type uh, shots of the the fishermen. Do you ask, do you uh, engage them or do you try to take shots of them in action and not engage them or how does that work? Well, after, um, after going there for a number of years, you know, eight years um, to this particular area, I know a lot of them. Uh -huh. And so... Um, one of the things I'd like to do is go out on some of their commercial boats and do some photography as they go out to fish. Um, and that's what I plan on doing next summer. That's one of the projects I, I want to do. But I've gotten to know a lot of the people that are doing the fishing and the fish cutters. And um, so it's it's easy for me to mm -hmm. say yeah, th easy. they look forward to it. And I always give them See the hobbies picture. when I do portraits. Oh, yeah, that's cool. There are 61 people on this. Beautiful work, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. Could I ask one last question? Uh -huh. um, when you talk with the, like the people that you encounter, uh -huh. especially I'm interested uh, in the fishermen, what, uh -huh. what do they say um, about like the their future and the future for uh, for them? Well, they're they're concerned about their future. Um, I know that um, the crabbing just pretty much ended in Alaska this year, and um, they're always on always watching quotas. Alaska can stop their fishing at any time, and they'll all they'll be sitting around tying their nets for days on end, just waiting for the season to open up. The state of Alaska will open up the season, and then they'll all go out. They're ready to go and all the harbor clears out and they're out there and then they'll all come back in a, a minute's notice if they close the fishing. So they're always trying to, to count the fish, how many they're getting. They can only get so many fish um, and it's a challenge for them. And sometimes they just close it down. You know, they spend all the money on their, their boats and their crew and their and all ready to go and then they'll just completely shut the fishing down but it was pretty good this year for the salmon i know the crab wasn't that great well thanks kathy thanks for taking mm -hmm. the time to put these together and sharing your work with us look oh. forward to seeing more in the future okay thank you mark all right we're going to move on to our main speaker uh, rick schaefer bob uh, you're going to introduce rick so what you want to go ahead and do that Sure. It's my, uh, I'm very happy to introduce our, tonight's uh, featured speaker, Rick Schaefer. Rick is going to talk to us about the photography of Ray Atkinson. Uh, Rick Schaefer is Ray Atkinson's stepson and manages and curates Ray's uh, archive of photographs. Uh, Ray Atkinson was a pioneer of landscape photography in the Pacific Northwest and made many iconic photos of Timberline Lodge, Sun Valley, Idaho, the Oregon, Washington, and California coast, Crater Lake, uh, the Cascades back in the 1930s to 1960s or 70s, at a time when these places were pristine and largely undiscovered. Uh, Rick will discuss how Ray was able to make such amazing photos using the cameras and gear of his day. Rick Schaefer is a successful commercial and landscape photographer living in Portland, Oregon. So Rick, uh, thanks very much for coming tonight to speak to uh, Portland Photographers Forum. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, so I just need share screen, is that right? That's right. Okay.
There we go. Let's see it. There you go. There you go. Looks good. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting to be inviting me to be part of the program. Um, I've managed this. I've been involved with this archive now for over fifty years. Uh, started when I was sixteen. Um, started with my first camera in high school. Um, uh, helped Ray. I, I was his protege. He was my mentor. Um, I worked in this office basically my entire professional career and uh, a lot of things go on in his business. There's a lot of licensing issues that go on and, and a lot of um, philanthrop philanthropic issues that go on. And so, um, you know, I, I've been able to have a moderately successful career in photography, but none of that ever would have been done without Ray. I mean, Ray set the table for a lot of people. And I just continued to pursue it because uh, I, I enjoyed it. It's just what I enjoyed doing. And Ray gave me an opportunity to explore the Northwest and be a part of it. And uh, it's been great. So with that, I've got about 20 images here. I'm more than happy to take questions on each image instead of, you know, bouncing back and forth. So this is... Um, so let me back up here for one second. The photos that we have in this show are being shown to you in chronological order of Ray's numbering system. So this is Rosie the Riveter taken in uh, Portland shipyards. And um, this was back, I believe he was still working at Photocraft at this time. I'm not sure, but I believe he was. Um, but the thing that some of the things that I learned from Ray were, you know, how to see through a camera and what you're finding. I really enjoyed the, um, slideshows, uh, such variety, such variety in terms of, um, you know, impressionistic, journalistic, editorial, landscape, the, the whole thing. It's fascinating for me to see how other people use their cameras. So the reason I put this photo in the show tonight is because when I look at this, what I've learned in my career and everything, Ray did an incredible job, not just of capturing the person, but of capturing the texture, the the leather, all the leather, even her face, the metal in the background. So those are the kind of subtle things that I kind of, Ray taught me about. It's like, hey, yeah, take a portrait, but think about what else is in the portrait. So that's that's one. Do you know what, about what year that was, if that's the beginning chronologically? He didn't take dates. Yeah. Rick, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, if you have any insight uh, in regard to how he worked with the people that he's photographing, for example, did he pose them at all? Um, how did he get insight? How did he bring out his insight of who they are? Um, I'd appreciate if you could share that with us. Well, um, I don't know what's happened here. Somehow my Zoom has gone up. So go to the next one again. And click on it. There we go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, trust me, I don't do Zoom a lot. So um, <laughs> let's go back to your question. Sure. What I was mentioning was he didn't date dates. He he did it chronologically so we've kind of been able to piece things together by knowing what year the ship or shipyards were there i think most of this work was done when he was working as master photographer at photo art i think this came from a series 
of work that he, photo art had him doing, but then he also did some of his own work there as well. He was fascinated with the lights of the city and the shipyards, and that that's not really what photo art was doing. Photo art was documenting the the defense industry and the ship shipyards. That's what they were documenting. Um, so in terms of this type of work, this was early on. This was 30s, 40s, when he was still at photo art. He didn't leave photo art until the 1940s. But it, and and that's he left photo art actually when color film came out. And he followed that path. Um, still shot a lot of black and white for the next 20 years. Um, but uh, um, uh, he he loved the color and he loved doing that. So, yeah. Let me see if I can get this to work. So, oh, there it is. Good. Sweet. So this is one of the things that I look at. This is the Click Attack Glacier on Mount Adams. And I, I'm guessing this is 30s still. I'm guessing this is the 30s still. And I look at that, I'm like, how, how did they even get up there? I mean, it's just amazing. It just amazes me what they did. And you know, you can see that the technical quality of the of the work isn't, you know, spectacular, but the conditions that he was dealing with don't forget he was carrying four by five camera to do all this stuff not 30 not 35 and with that came in the summer snow months he didn't tend to use a tripod quite as much because it was so bright and he could get away with hand holding his his uh, four by five and at this time he was shooting with a speed graphic Obviously, he was a mountaineer, a climber, and an explorer. This is the shoot up on Mount Hood. And uh, yeah, he loved the mountains. He absolutely loved the mountains. And then we transferred to this area of his vision, which, again, you know, very early on, Swift's premium ham and bacon is in the background. I believe we're still in the 30s here. Um, but, you know, his vision for light and, and how film saw light and his timing for light. And that's one of the other things that I learned from him was the study of weather and the study of where light is at various times of the year and how that changes what you can do, you know? Like he would never, he always shot his city photos of Portland in the, um, in the uh, winter months because the days are short and there were more people in the office buildings. So there were more lights on. That's how he pursued it. This is down on the Columbia River. It's a salmon fishing derby. Rick, I'm kind of curious. It's like, how do you store like his negatives? And then the second question is um, like, are you printing from his negatives? Um, I made the decision um, a number of years ago uh, well, let me back up a little bit. When Ray was still alive, we were going through a process in all of his work was stored in a um, cinder block vault in the basement of his house. Not, not, um, not, there was no air in there. There was no refrigeration. And there came a point early when I was there that we discovered some of the negatives were deteriorating in that the gelatin was actually peeling off of the plastic. 
So we modified that. We made some changes. And uh, then when I took it over, I had an office in our first house. And I found a walk-in refrigerator from a Sizzler Steakhouse. It was a portable refrigeration unit. And I, uh, we installed that in the garage, and that's where we kept them. But at, at some point, it became too cumbersome to have this archive in our home. Like, if we were traveling or whatever, you know. So uh, my wife and I uh, donated the negatives and the transparencies to the University of Oregon, to the Phil Knight Library, the, the, the special collections area. And they are all in either refrigeration or frozen storage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in answer to your other question, what we have is, I don't know if you guys can see behind me, but there's a wooden cabinet back there. So we have many, many, all of these were scanned, not from the negative. They were scanned from what Ray would do is he would go out and shoot and then he would come back. And then, I mean, the guy worked seven days a week. He never stopped. He was either out shooting or in his office selling work or, or in the dark room. And so every time he shot new negatives, he would go in the dark room and he would make eight by 10 prints. And those were referred to as reprograde prints. Okay. And the reason they were called reprograde, for those of you that aren't familiar with that, is that back in this day, the printing industry, a lot of these were being used by newspapers and whatnot. And the printing industry was so high contrast in their printing capabilities but Ray was going very, very low on the contrast on these because he knew the, re the reproduction in the newspaper would come out better. So we have this entire collection of what we call reprograde prints. They're eight by tens. They're all shot with, by four by five. Um, I use an Epson scanner here to scan them and we digitize them. We sell, uh, 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 different forms of prints, but, but that's kind of, yeah. Does that, does that answer, was that a good answer for you? Yes. Well, I'm kind of curious too, because like when you uh, were kind of zooming in on, um, I think it was uh, the Rosie, the Riveter uh, mm -hmm. photograph, I noticed like there was a lot of scratches uh, and, um, you know, even dust on, that particular, I assume that that was like a print or whether that was a repro print or whatever it was. That and was an original that, print by Ray. Yeah. So these are all unretouched. These are scanned just the way Ray did it. This is a collection that I keep that records these 8x10 prints because eventually these 8x10 prints prints will end up down at the University of Oregon as well. So when Ray was still alive and he was having fiber-based fiber -based prints made by a gentleman by the name of Tom Robinson, and Tom turned these, we turned them, Tom turned them into more high-key images, more contrast, blacker blacks. And then we would take these over to a lady in Portland by the name of Ann Matulich. And Ann was a retoucher. And she retouched all of these fiber-based prints that we were making, that were selling in galleries and selling in the retail marketplace. So these are simply documenting. I, I, I keep them this way when I speak because I want to show the authenticity and the challenges that they were facing. This is down in Ecola State Park, and that is his daughter, Eleanor.
aerial photography back in the day. This is an image called Sanctuary. It was taken up in the uh, Columbia Gorge. And the reason it's called Sanctuary is because it was an extremely hot day and the sheep were seeking shade. That's That was his view of the world. Slado, this is one of his signature shots. But he spent a lot of time. He's got a lot of different work up in Celilo. And, uh, but yeah, that's, you know, I mean, this image is sold all over the world. All over the world. It's, it's one of his single most iconic images. He loved all the mountains. He loved St. Helens. He loved Adams. He loved Baker. He loved Rainier. He uh, loved Shasta. He loved Mount Hood. Love Jefferson. I think he climbed most of them. I don't know. I don't I don't think he ever I don't think he ever summited Rainier or uh Baker, but I think he summited the rest of the peaks. Now again, this is back in, you know. 40s probably um and obviously it's winter and there's snow and i just i've never been able to understand the vehicles that they used to get them to these places and what they had to deal with what they were doing i mean it's just amazing to me how they were so determined to find these pristine places and get there on the right day on the right time it, it just amazes me his his foresight as a photographer was he he was ahead of himself he was very much ahead of himself and this is something a lot of people had never seen probably at that time so no. you know he brought it out there for everybody well, in a lot of these photos during this time period, 30s, 40s, these were all being sold to what they called rotogravure roto um, publications. And th these were travel publications in the New York paper, the Philadelphia paper, the Chicago paper. And he they, they were showing this grand west out here. That's that's what their articles were about. They were using his black and white imagery, showing the grandness of the West. And, you know, he he had this way about him. Like, you know, he's got these girls in here, you know. And um, I've had many people come up to me and say, you know that picture of the gorge? That, that was me in that photo. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, that's great. Cool. So how long was he actively shooting? He started in the 1930s and he pretty much ended when he was diagnosed with cancer in 1989, 1990. Yeah. His cancer went very, very quickly. So we were actually teaching a workshop together with another photographer um, over in Central Oregon and we were up at Big Lake and, you know, so we're walking and he stops. I'm like, what's going on? And he says, I don't have the strength to make it back to the car. I'm like, what? Hmm. I said, all right, well, you sit down. We'll bring the car over here and let's get you back to Portland. And that's when he was diagnosed and it was advanced cancer. And so he still shot while he was sick, though. Last picture he ever took, he and I went over to the rhododendron test gardens. The last picture he ever took. So. And, you know, this is an image 
not just of the coastline, but this is an image just showing the engineering that went into Highway 101. I mean, look at that cliff. Look at what they had to work with and work around. And, and you know, he was very much a part of the industrial era. And he enjoyed showing it. He enjoyed beautifying it, if you will. Four by five camera. What he was doing is they were pre-planning these shots. This is over at Anthony Lakes in Eastern Oregon. And they were pre-composing these shots so that the skiers knew exactly where to go. And he would set up the scene and wait for the skiers to come down. Four by five. You only got one shot. You don't, you don't have... You don't get to take multiple shots like this. So, you know, some of the things he did with action, it just amazes me. And, of course, again, we go back to that era, and, you know, he didn't really know what he had because he couldn't see the back of the camera. It's like the fisherman. He That's something that he couldn't really stage. He just had to catch that moment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Again, his iconic shot of uh, Mount Hood, Timberline Lodge, he was up there. He knew the storm was coming in. He knew it was going to be a full moon. The storm cleared that, you know, that evening. Full moon came up, and those were his tracks coming down through the snow to where he took the photograph from. Doesn't look real. Pardon me? It doesn't look real. It, it looks not. like a fantasy. There's there's a rumor. It was on Timberline Lodges. Um, but the people that were involved with the movie The Shining, that was the image they saw. Oh. They saw mm -hmm. that image. Mm -hmm. So he traveled down and he had a very romantic side to nature. He loved nature. Just very romantic. But he saw it graphically. He saw it activity-wise. He, he just saw so much that a camera could capture. Another 4 by 5 shot. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is Alf Ingen who was the pioneer that founded Alta, Utah. So this is in Alta, Utah. And he was back there photographing he and his son for a Boy's Life article. And um, what he would do is he would throw a snowball out there. And that way they would know where to turn. It's it's the images like this with the technology that he was using. They just blow me away, you know, how this industry has progressed. And, and it's progressed in good ways. I mean, I, I don't have any problem with its progression. I, it, it's all been good, you know. Um, but I think I was telling Bob, you know, my introduction into photography and my historical background studying it, as I'm sure many of you do too, um, you know, photography, color film wasn't always around. It, it started. It started with black. Mm -hmm. Stand up in here, and and it was uh, it was it was an interpretive process. In other words, the negative had to be interpreted onto paper, and um, just. And then and then that, and then color transparency film came out. And 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 that became what it was basically. Color yeah. negative came out, yeah. that was the darkroom process. Yeah, so you mean it. What um what was going on 
the, then the transparency thing got really, really big. And now we have color digital theories where there are individuals with cameras who want to shoot everything right in the the camera itself and not go through the, the dark room digital process because like when I'm in when I'm doing my digital work um I keep it very simple I burn and dodge it's really all I do I just burn and dodge I'll control contrast I'll control um you know uh, saturation, some color balance, but, you know, I'll just, I'll just, um, you know, just burn and dodge mostly how I interpret my digital work. So did he shoot any color or did, was it mostly black and white? Did he stay with black and white? No, he started shooting color in 1940. Okay. When so when it came food. out. Yeah. So that, that was what he was known for. And uh, so this was a Rose Festival event in Multnomah <laughs> Stadium. And I don't know who would go up that scaffolding. <laughs> it's going to be nuts to do something like that. Wow. And then come back down it. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine how rickety that stuff must have been. But, you know, you, you can see he's just, he was so cultured and, and in nature and so this is the dynamite blast uh that started the dallas dam he -hmm. was there for this event and um you know he was everywhere he just went everywhere that's actually ray in this photo this is the paradise ice caves up on uh mount rainier and Ray used to have this little uh, spring-loaded device that you could twist into the cable release on the large format lenses. Not the cable release itself, but where the cable release screws into, he would take the cable release out, and then he would put this self-timer in there. It was just spring-loaded and gave him about 10 seconds. So he was there. He took this shot. But the camera was on basically a four by five camera was basically on a self timer, and he posed in that. Down at Cape Kowanda, the Dory races. Wasn't taken on a beautiful blue sky day. It was taken on a foggy day. And in his mind, that added to the allure of the image. This is fishing down on the Umpqua. Again, you see he's got someone in there for scale. So on these prints you have, is there information written on them that helps you sure. understand what it is? Yeah, the prints have a um, the prints have so see if you can see this. So the prints all have his stamp on the back. Mm -hmm. stamp, handwritten negative number. And then up above, there's his, some of the prints have his scribbling on them, which are very hard to read. And then others of the prints, um, but this is what the front of the print looks like. Eight by 10 glossies. And that's where they're stored all in here. Any idea how many you've got there stored? Uh, well, we had, at one time, we had 40,000 negatives, mm -hmm. 4 by 5 negatives. So I've never really counted. Um, he didn't print every negative. Um, so uh, 
uh, I don't know, 5,000 is the number that sticks out to me. And then mm -hmm. we probably have, well, between his work and my work, there's probably over a quarter million color images. Wow. So, and this is uh, over in Hawaii. And uh, this was one of kind shots, you know. So anyway, I didn't know how much time we have, but that's the show. If anybody has any more questions or would like to go back and revisit an image, but uh, that's what he looked like. Rick, I have a, a question. Is like you have um, intimate knowledge of like an amazing body of work and also you got to rub shoulders like on a, a regular basis with a guy that was full of passion and vision and so what's your takeaway from that like about photography going into the future now, going into your, the future well you know first of all like what's your takeaway and then you know it's like photography you know has um like you said, progressed. And so I'm kind of curious what uh, what you see about that or what your thoughts are about that. Well, um, that's a really good question. Um, well, that's why I asked you. I think, I think, <laughs> I think things like this, I think processes like this are circular. I think people go back and learn from history and they they find previous ways to create new work. That's 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 the only way I know how to answer that. They you know like I see I mean we we it was really interesting. I took I taught two workshops uh, one fall workshop and one winter workshop. And there were two students specifically that took both workshops. And in the fall workshop, the um, one of the students absolutely blew it out of the park with his color work. And the other student, she couldn't take a color picture to save her life. So we get to the winter workshop. Now the first student can't take a good photo. And she's the one that was successful in black and white. And that taught me that in using a camera and how this, how photography progresses and where it goes from, um, it, it goes back to how people see how they see the world how do they how do they want to use a camera to see the world that that's that's what i see in it. and everybody's different the first thing i do when i teach a workshop or teach class students or anything the first thing i do is is we have you know a little uh uh you know introductory thing and all i do if, if it's a weekend event um, the first thing I do is I meet with each student individually and I try and find out what their comfort level is, what they're interested in. I'm not, they're not there to learn how to take pictures like I do. And so um, some of them enjoy shooting much more interpretive things. Some of them enjoy shooting the big picture, but what the way I learned photography is, you know, it's about composition, it's about light, it's about uh, uh, you know subject matter, it's about learning how to control the camera, and then you learn to use it as a tool. And um, I just think what's being done these days, you know, even with cell phones, is still amazing work. Hey, I have a question. Um, this is great stuff. Um, you know, it rivals in, in many ways uh, 
some of the work of Ansel Adams, who published untold numbers of books. Uh, did Ray ever publish any books? Are you thinking about publishing, or have you published any books about his work? So Ray had Ray was a pioneer in the book public, publishing industry. It happened in 1967. Um, he was approached by a printing company in Portland called Graphic Arts Printing. And they had a salesman over there by the name of Charles Belvey. And um, Charles Belvey lived across the street from my mom and dad and I. And we knew the, the mom and dad knew the Atkinson socially. And Charles was talking about this new printing press that they got back in 1966. Color Heidelberg Press, state of the art. And so they did the first Oregon book. And they came over to Ray's place and they had like, they'd never seen a collection of work like this. They, they weren't even thinking about the black and white stuff. They were so impressed with this color because that's what they printed their, wanted their printer to do. So um, they did the first Oregon book and they printed 10,000 copies. It was a $29.95 book at that time, I think. Ray got a dollar a book. And um, he took they took half the books and they put them in the retail market and he got paid a royalty when they sold. But the other half graphic arts took and they handed them out to every ad agency and corporate entity in the state of Oregon that was going to be using this type of printing. And they got so much business out of it. The, or the first Oregon book ended up selling 105,000 copies. But Graphic Arts got so much work in their printing business, that's when they really started to take off. So they came back to Ray. They said, hey, Ray, you want to do a Washington book? Did a Washington book. Then they came back for another Oregon, too. And then they came to him and said, could you do a California book? And um, he said, yeah, I can do Northern California, um, but I can't do Southern. And I don't know if you guys, if all of you are familiar with the, the name Munch in the photography industry. Joseph Munch was a pioneer down in Arizona, Arizona highways and whatnot. And uh, um He had a son, his son is David Munch, who became a very prolific American landscape photographer. Probably, probably the, during his era, he was at the top. And uh, anyway, that was David's first book that Ray invited him to be a part of because Ray knew Joseph. And now um, I'm the same era as David's son, Mark. So we've kind of grown up in this industry with mentors, if you will. And, uh, but Ray ended up doing probably, I don't know. I, I, I'm guessing 15 books, something like that. Um, I have 20 books to my credit of my own work that I've done with other, with other uh, publishers and whatnot. So, yeah, we, we were in that industry. And then, you know, when Ray first started, he was working for photo art. So he was a commercial photographer. Well, as the, as the 35 millimeter started to get decent in the nineties in terms of film and of um, lens quality, the industry changed during that time because more people had access to the marketplace and the marketplace we were in all we all we could use was four by five because that was just the best quality there was and so the industry became more competitive and 
more saturated and people started traveling more. And so I, you know, started to gravitate into other areas of photography. In terms of the books that I've had published, I've had six cookbooks published because I absolutely love photographing food. Um, and we did some other things, get a book on Oregon golf. Um, but yeah, we were, we were major, we were, we were majorly into the publishing industry, majorly into the publishing industry. I might uh, just say, uh, I raised, believe our raised books are available. In, uh, These books What's are that? available on Amazon too. Well, I'm sorry. They raised books. I've seen them on Amazon, and I did purchase one. Oh, did you really? Oh, good. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, they're out there. They're still there. Rick. Yeah. When when uh, your stepdad retired down at Cannon Beach, I would yeah. see him down on the beach. He was going blind, I believe, but he still yeah. had his four by five hiked yes. up on his tripod looking for yes. sunsets. Yes. Yeah. Probably out in front of Haystack Rock. No, he was. Up. He, he was on the north end. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, we still have that home in our family. Yeah, Ray loved the beach. He, he went from the mountains. When you're young, the mountains are a lot easier. Oh, <laughs> 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 you get the beach is a lot easier. A uh, wonderful book that he did was The Cascade Range. I yes. think it was published in the 60s. Yes. Um, I bought actually, it actually was in the seventies. Seventies, okay. I bought it in the late seventies when I was living in Connecticut, and that's one of the reasons I decided to move out here. Hmm. Oh, cool, cool. So, Rick, I know how many people? Rick, Rick I have a, I have a book by um, Myra also. Um, yes. What if you could talk about her work and how and she and Ray work together? She was his traveling companion. Um. She loved the outdoors. Uh, she didn't shoot four by five or anything like that. She had a little uh, 35 millimeter point and shoot that she would carry with her. Um, but she wasn't, Ray, Ray did that book as a, um, in honor of her. That was done after she passed and he wanted to memorialize her work. And so that's why that book was created. And, you know, she was good. She participated in, uh, you know, in, back in the day, they called them camera clubs. And she was competitive in it. And she took good shots, but she was shooting over Ray's shoulder. So. <laughs> Rick, I wanted to ask you about uh, Ray's business acumen. It's like, how much of his energy did he put into uh you know, in the business aspect of, uh, you know, of photography? Uh, well, that was his business, but it was all licensing back then. It wasn't, he, once he left photo art, he wasn't, um, he wasn't uh, doing commercial work anymore. So back in the day, he started doing these books, these coffee table books. And they were generating a lot of money. And uh, he also had a relationship um, with a company in Minnesota called Environmental Graphics. And they're a mural company. They make wall murals. And I remember seeing... I remember seeing, like, sometime back in the 70s, we had these old cash books that he recorded the cash that came in, in these books for his log. And, uh, in, in, in the 1970s, just off of those two companies, he was making something like $80,000 a year, just in royalties. He wasn't shooting for them. He'd, he'd sold, he'd licensed them his work 
and he was making that type of royalty money and he could still go on and shoot and do what he wanted to do and create other projects and work with Wyden Kennedy and ad agencies and publishers in Minnesota doing calendars and, you know, uh, uh, ad agencies, creative companies in New York and Los Angeles, his work was being sought out, but it was all licensed. It wasn't, he wasn't being hired to do the work. It, they were just so enamored with his photos that they were licensing them for their products and their advertising efforts. And, you know, back in that day, like I said, there wasn't a competition. Competition wasn't there. I have a question. Uh, lots of artists uh, struggle with perfectionism and just, you know, letting go. And I'm just curious what his attitude was towards uh, that sort of thing or how he handled adversity when, when the setup, all the planning went into it and then the picture didn't turn out as expected. Uh, or he had a vision for something and he just couldn't get it. Uh, what was he like with that? <laughs> to, to Ray, and, and and what one of the things that I learned from him, it wasn't a job. It was a passion. He he didn't look at it as work. He he just this was his passion in life. And he was financially able to pursue it based on the quality of his work, you know? And for me, I tell people, you know, my friends, if I tell my friends I have a bad day, um, I don't usually get much sympathy from them. I'm not talking about my photography pens. I'm talking about my friends who work in the steel industry or things like that. And like, as your day, I said, I'm having a tough day. Rick, you're a photographer. How can you have a tough day? <laughs> and so um anyway that's the same for me it's just a passion for me and somebody asked me not too long ago I said when are you going to retire so what am I going to retire from what what am I going to do so you know it's afforded us the opportunity to travel to see places to do those types of things to be creative to be successful and modestly and that's that would be my answer to that. So maybe you don't take it seriously. Be serious about the craft. Maybe he didn't take it seriously. I mean, he was serious about the craft and the business, but it was his life. Yeah, it was his life. It wasn't, I mean, he was called a professional. But, okay, let, I'll give you one more story here real quick. So... Ray received an honorary doctorate's degree of fine art from Linfield College. He was um, he was invited to the spring graduation. Uh, he wore a cap and gown. Uh, my mom went with him. I believe this was in the seventies. Yeah, I think it was in the 70s. Yeah, 70s or early 80s. So they go to this lifetime award, this honor of him receiving an honorary doctorate's degree of fine art. Okay. They sit down. They're sitting there waiting for the ceremony to start. And my mom looks over at Ray and she says, what's that? And he had a he had a transistor radio in his pocket and there was a cord coming from the transistor radio up to the ear on the other side of mom. She couldn't see it, but she kind of saw the cord or something. He was mad because he had to give up his blazer tickets. They were in the playoffs and he didn't want to be at this stupid award ceremony. <laughs> that, that was his view on life. I mean, he, he had his own way of seeing things. Anybody else have questions for Rick?
All right, if no one else has questions, uh, thanks Rick for sharing this with us and kind of sharing some of the stories about what life was like with him. My pleasure. Uh, I My learned pleasure. a lot today. My pleasure. Anytime you guys need help with that, want to see more for, more images sometime, you want to see his color work, I'd be happy to do the same thing for you guys. So hope you guys all have a great evening and a great rest of the week. Thanks and same to you. Thank and we you. look forward to seeing more. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank so much, Rick. Much. Thanks for the history yeah. lesson too. It was fun to hear all this. And I saw yeah. at least one. I saw at least one person hold up one of his books. I think it was Kathleen. Yeah. There's another. Oh, there's another one right there, with Bill Kirby. I got four. <laughs> <laughs> we have a couple of minutes left. Does anybody have any announcements that they want to make or anything that they want to share? Summer doldrums. All right. I'll well, share. maybe I'll I'll share just one thing. So I'm new, a new okay. member. Go for it. And I was intrigued by the speaker. And so I just thought I'd comment saying that's finally I've joined after, um, you know, knowing about the group for a very long time. <laughs> so mm -hmm. well, uh, I'm welcome. really happy, happy to be here and have this was a great night watching. Good. Good. Glad you joined us. Thank you, Catherine. Anybody else? Well, you said summer doldrums and stuff, and I thought, well, gosh, I don't feel like I'm having summer doldrums. I just found out uh, a couple of days ago, I got uh, included in a, a little book that's put out by A. Smith Gallery, um, and they shoot, they chose like 27 images out of, I can't remember, 1,035, or I, I can't remember what the number was. And uh, I thought, well, that's pretty cool. And so, like... I'm going to get this little book. Yeah, yeah, that is cool. That's cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, you guys. Yeah, thank you. All right. Rick. Thanks, Rick. I, I hope to meet again. Thank you. Bye-bye. And I guess we're going to go ahead and wrap this up and a couple of minutes early. Uh, everybody take care. Enjoy the rest of the summer. Hope to see you at our meeting in September or and uh, also the print share that we do the first Monday of September. Uh, will, that print share, will the print share happen? I think that's Labor Day. Uh, oh, is it? Then we've uh, that's right. Let me look at that. Somebody's looking at, out ahead, huh? Yeah, we are going to have to uh, make an adjustment. So we'll make an announcement about that. Uh, either we'll reschedule it or we'll skip it. Thanks for pointing that out, Giannis. No charge. <laughs> okay, I won't be expecting the bill. <laughs> and, and please get in touch with me if you want to participate in our portrait shoot. That's right. And if somebody else wants to uh, host a photo outing, uh, let Joe know. All right, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. Uh, have a good evening and a good rest of your summer. <laughs>